Hello, beautiful people. Thank you for joining me here today. I hope you are having a wonderful week and that your week only gets better from here on out. My name is Liz and I regularly sit here and talk about things like true crime, weird history, conspiracy theories, unsolved mysteries, all that kind of thing. So if that sounds like something you might be interested in, then hit subscribe, hit the bell, and we can just be best friends forever and ever and ever. You know, if you're into that kind of thing. No pressure. And if you're like, Liz, I don't really care about you. I just came here to see that really cute dog I saw in the intro, then firstly, rude. Um, secondly, she's right here. She's very codependent and she's never more than six feet away from me. It's like the opposite of social distancing. Uh, editing Liz, switch to Lily Cam. There she is, Lily, show us a beautiful face. What a cutie pie. So yeah, if you hear any noise disturbances in this video, don't freak out. It's not a ghost. It's just my dog ruining my life as per usual. So today we are here to talk about a very mysterious case about a little flight taken by one Frederick Valetich on the early evening of the 21st of October 1978. Frederick was just 20 years old and was working his way towards his commercial pilot license. He had about 150 hours of flight time under his belt and when he submits his flight plan that night at the Moorabbin briefing office, he tells the briefing officer his plan is to fly to King Island, which is just across the Bass Strait at the bottom of Australia. It belongs to the state of Tasmania. There he's going to pick up some friends and then make the flight with them back to Moorabbin. Frederick gets the all clear for the flight plan, so he grabs four life jackets for his friends, uh, has the tank filled to capacity on the Cessna 182 he's hired for the evening, and departs from Moorabbin at 6.19pm. Now, this would be the first time that Frederick was flying at night over water, and it's more dangerous to fly over water than it is over land. So Frederick was going to depart from Moorabbin, kind of hug the coast to Camp Otway, and then fly across the Bass Strait to King Island, hence lessening the time he would be flying over open water. He checks in with the Melbourne Flight Service Unit, or the FSU as we'll refer to them, just at 7pm as he's flying over Cape Otway, and by all accounts everything is fine, everything is running smoothly and just as planned. However, when he radios back in not much later at 7.06 p.m., just as the last of daylight is giving way slowly to darkness, things have taken a very strange turn. You see, Frederick has just experienced another aircraft flying at very high speeds that came out of nowhere, nearly colliding with him. When he contacts the FSU to ask if there were any other flights planned at below 5,000 feet, which is the altitude that he's traveling, the FSU advised him, no, there's no other flights planned and there should be no other aircraft in the area. He advises them that there is definitely another aircraft in the area and a very large one at that. When they ask him to identify the aircraft, Frederick can't say he can't identify it, instead saying it has four very bright lights in the shape of a rectangle and it looks to him like landing strip lights. Just over 30 seconds later, the aircraft flies past Frederick again, this time at over 1,000 feet above him and again flying at massive speeds. So fast he can't get a grasp on the shape or size of it. He tries the FSU again and asks this time if there are any Air Force aircrafts in the area, assuming it must be military because of the speed of it. But the FSU just advised him again that no, there should be no aircrafts in the area. The aircraft flies past Frederick again and again and again in very quick succession. He tells the FSU that he feels like it's playing a game with him, that it's taunting him. The FSU are obviously more than a little alarmed at this point and start hammering Frederick with questions, asking him, to confirm which altitude he's traveling at, what the aircraft looks like, if he can possibly identify it. But they can't make out all of Frederick's responses because the transmission keeps getting broken up by loud bursts of static. They hear him say, 
it is not an aircraft, it is... But Frederick's next words get drowned out by the static. Frederick at this point is now just pretty much flying in circles. He doesn't know whether to try and continue on to King Island or to circle back and try to fly back to Cape Otway or Moorabbin. As he's doing this orbiting, the aircraft is suddenly right in front of him, almost motionless except for slowly mimicking his movements. He can now see that it has a long shape, it has a green light, and that its exterior is metallic and shiny. He refers this information back to the FSU and as he does this, the aircraft pretty much straight up vanishes in front of his face and then suddenly flies at him again now from a southwest direction. Just to add to an already dire situation, Frederick now tells the FSU that his Cessna has started coughing and splattering like the engine is going to die, even though the tank is still close to full. At 7.12pm, Frederick advises the FSU that his plan is to continue on to King Island. His last known words are, the strange aircraft is hovering on top of me again. It is hovering and it is not an aircraft. There follows one 17 second singular transmission in which Frederick holds the receiver button down but says nothing. Instead, you can hear a metallic thunking sound and what sounds like electronic pulsing. I'm going to play a recording of that 17 second transmission for you now. At 7.33 p.m. when Frederick does not show up at King Island, a massive intensive four day air, land and sea search ensues and it turns up nothing other than an oil slick in the water which when tested proves to not match the fuel from the Cessna that Frederick was flying. Frederick has literally vanished into thin air and the only evidence that investigators have to go off is a recording of the seven minute conversation between him and the FSU. Newspapers catch wind of the story and eagerly start printing stories about the young pilot that was supposedly abducted by a UFO mid-flight and the public just goes wild. Frederick's family now not only having to deal with his sudden and mysterious disappearance have to deal with the press calling them, harassing them, knocking on their door, asking for interviews and all of the gossip and lies being spread in the newspapers about Frederick. Investigators from the Department of Transport looking into Frederick's disappearance were initially stumped by there being no trace of the Cessna or Frederick being found in the search efforts. If the Cessna had crashed into the ocean, which seemed to be the most logical explanation to them, there would have had to have been some evidence of this crash found either in the four-day search or by the many, many boats, ships and planes that frequently crossed the busy Bass Strait. All of them had been told about the missing plane and been asked to keep an eye out. The Cessna had buoyant components designed to float to the surface in the instance that the plane crashed into water. So there should have been something found, but there was nothing. You couldn't blame the investigators for starting to question if maybe Frederick really was abducted by aliens. Soon though, the investigation started to turn up some strange details about Frederick's behavior leading up to the disappearance. And some of these details made investigators question if it had ever been Frederick's intention to fly to King Island as his flight plan stated, if in fact he had actually gone off course and this is why the search efforts failed. While I mentioned at the beginning that Frederick had told his briefing officer that his plan was to fly to King Island to pick up his friends and had even been reported as putting four life jackets into the Cessna, no one was waiting on King Island that night for Frederick to pick them up. And contrary to this story of picking up friends, 
Frederick had told his family and his girlfriend for quite some time leading up to the trip that his plan was to fly to King Island to pick up an order of crayfish, but there had been no such order placed. In fact, at the time, there was no crayfish to order on King Island as the whole crayfishing industry shuts down between mid-September and November. And even if Frederick had found someone that was willing to catch crayfish outside of season, Frederick wasn't permitted to transport the crayfish on the plane he had hired. He also gave conflicting stories about his arrival home to his girlfriend Rhonda Rushton and to his father, Guido Valetic. He told Rhonda he would meet her at 7.30 p.m. to take her out, which was a time he couldn't possibly keep. And still living at home with his parents, he told Guido that he would be coming straight home after his trip to King Island. On top of all this, despite apparently planning the trip for quite some time, Frederick never called ahead to King Island Airport to ask them to leave the landing lights on for him, even though he knew they would be closed at the time he was arriving. This would have left him with the near impossible task of landing the Cessna he was flying without any lights to guide him. There are a couple of explanations I can throw in here though. Um, it could have been Frederick's intention all along to pick up some undocumented order of crayfish like he told his family and his girlfriend but he knew he wasn't going to be allowed to transport it on the plane if they knew about it. So instead he cooked up a story for the briefing officer about picking up friends and then chucked the life jackets onto the Cessna just to kind of prove his story. And Frederick's mess up of not calling ahead to King Island and asking them to leave the landing lights on for him could just be chalked up to his lack of experience and knowledge. Frederick might not have known that he needed to call ahead. And this is especially likely because while Frederick was studying part-time to earn his commercial pilot license or CPL, he was having a pretty rough time of it to say the least. Earlier that year, he had sat and failed all five of the exams for the subjects he needed to obtain his CPL. And he did this not once, but twice. He had also accidentally flown into the Sydney control zone, which was a big no-no, and he received an official warning for this. And on two separate occasions, he had been caught flying deliberately directly through clouds, and this was not allowed on the license he was on. He only could fly when he had perfect visibility when he could see exactly where he was going as he was too inexperienced to just rely on the plane's navigational system. At the time of his disappearance, it was still being decided if he was going to be prosecuted for flying through these clouds. And all of this was after he was rejected not once but twice by the Royal Australian Air Force as he had inadequate educational qualifications. So obtaining his CPL was not going as smoothly as Frederick had hoped. Because of his lack of experience and the fact that this was the first time he was flying at night over water, the theory has been put forward that perhaps Frederick got disoriented and at some point um, accidentally ended up flying upside down and the aircraft that he thought he was seeing was actually his own reflection in the water below him. Or that he again became disoriented and started accidentally spiralling towards the water without realising and that the bright lights he was seeing was actually the star Antares and the planets Venus, Mars and Mercury. The theory that he was flying upside down, which just seems a little crazy to me, like it seems more logical that he was abducted by a UFO, but some pilots have come forward and said it's not that unlikely that he was flying upside down and didn't realise it. You know, just a totally non-terrifying thing for pilots to come forward and admit. But the Cessna model that he was flying, it had a gravity-fed fuel system and it couldn't have flown inverted for a long period of time. Its engine would have given out very quickly. Also, while there was a green light on the wing of the Cessna, the plane itself was painted blue and white, not metallic and shiny like the aircraft Frederick said he saw. As for the spiraling and the stars and planets theory, it didn't get dark that night until 7.18pm and Frederick had spoken 
spoken at 7.06 p.m. about bright lights to the FSU. This was a full 12 minutes before darkness fell, so it's arguable whether this star and the planets would have been bright at this stage or even visible. It's also, of course, been suggested that this was just an elaborate suicide mission or the trip was a decoy for Frederick to stage his disappearance and start a new life. But these theories were all but ruled out by interviews with his family, with his girlfriend Rhonda, with his flying buddies and his colleagues. Colleagues, because according to the countless people that knew Frederick, he was a very happy and well-adjusted young man. He had even proposed to Rhonda a week before the incident and given her a friendship ring as a placeholder for a more expensive ring that he had on layby and was steadily paying off. So was it all a hoax, one that went terribly wrong? A recording of the seven-minute conversation between Frederick and the FSU does exist. It's just never been released to the public except for the last 17 seconds that I played you earlier. The Department of Transport said that it went against their policies to release audio tapes of accident investigations. According to reports from those who have heard the tape, though, despite being in an apparent game of cat and mouse with an unidentified flying object, which should be enough to have anyone panicking and fearing for their lives, Frederick sounded calm, almost unfazed. Was this because there was no aircraft and he was making the whole thing up? It turns out Frederick did have a very keen interest in all things extraterrestrial. In fact, the whole family did. Frederick used to keep newspaper clippings of articles that spoke of UFO sightings. He had a ton of alien-themed books and he loved alien movies. Frederick's father, Guido, has stated multiple times that he believes Frederick was abducted by aliens and that they're going to return him to them at a later date. And Frederick's mother, Alberta, said that eight months before the incident, she and Frederick had observed a UFO through the kitchen window of their home. And it wasn't long after this sighting that Frederick started expressing fears of a UFO attack and the devastation this would cause. After bringing up this fear multiple times, his father eventually turned around and said, not to worry. And I must admit, I give this advice myself all the time. If something is going to happen, it's going to happen. Worrying about it does not change the outcome. You've just caused yourself a bunch of mental anguish. And on top of that, you'll have to go through whatever you were worrying about in the first place. So in the face of his greatest fear, a UFO, was Frederick just taking his father's advice and that's why he sounded so calm on the recording. If he had made everything up, why was there a rash of sightings of unidentified aerial phenomena that took place across the country for weeks leading up to the disappearance, reaching a dizzying peak with at least 15 sightings reported just on that night. Some of these witnesses came forward after the story had already made headlines, so you may find it easy to disregard them, but in the opinion of a lot of people, these are the ones that deserve a little consideration. A man named P. Farr, who was an officer in the Royal Australian Air Force, contacted the Department of Transport to advise him that on that night of the disappearance, he had witnessed a shower of very bright metallic scintillations to the north, high in the sky, about 30 bright centres. Another man by the name of Wayne Bellew said that he had also witnessed UAP that night when he was camping with his wife in Batemans Bay in New South Wales. He described a bright white object performing wild stunts over the ocean, going on to add that the thing was performing such incredible manoeuvres that any conventional pilot who tried it would have been guts over kneecaps. And one month before Frederick and the Cessna had even disappeared, a woman wrote to the editor of King Island News saying, We saw our first sighting two months ago. We were driving into Curry and a slow moving light followed us down the north road and finally disappeared towards the lighthouse. There were other sightings in Curry on the same night. Some people further up north also saw a strange light passing over their house. Then another told of seeing beautiful strange lights outside. 
On going out to investigate, the light suddenly disappeared. Then, last night, the strange light appeared again, just up from Camp Creek. On each of these occasions, the light has been very large and bright, and seems to light up the area as if it was daylight. On top of these witness accounts, one week after the disappearance, Steve Roby, who was the air services controller on the other end of the radio with Frederick that night, had another UAP sighting incident with a different pilot. The pilot was flying in the vicinity of Sale, not far at all from King Island, when he radioed in and reported to Steve Roby an extremely bright light moving from west to east. He spoke to Roby again a few minutes later saying he had seen the light again and if it occurred one more time he was going to land the plane. When he saw the light the third time, this time beneath him, he was forced to interrupt the flight and land the plane for fear that he was otherwise going to be struck down by this moving light. The investigation took two and a half years to complete, and in August of 1981, the Department of Transport admitted in their final report that they could not confirm what became a Frederick or the Cessna, but instead offered up five hypotheses. Number one, Frederick became disoriented and crashed into the ocean. They noted that if this was the case, it was extremely unusual that no wreckage had been found. Number two, Frederick intentionally landed on the ocean. They suggested that this could explain the lack of wreckage as the plane could have sunk to the bottom of the ocean completely intact, most likely with Frederick inside. Number three, Frederick had completed a controlled landing somewhere else, that he wasn't where he said he was and he had planned on landing somewhere other than King Island the entire time. Number four, Frederick crashed on land while attempting to complete a controlled landing and the wreckage just simply hadn't been found yet. And number five, UFO intervention. Unfortunately, they falsely stated here that there had been no reports of UAP on that evening. So for a long time, the most widely accepted explanation of Frederick's disappearance was that he had staged his own disappearance, that he had lied to the FSU about where he was and that he had used the strange aircraft story as a decoy. But in May of 1983, a small piece of debris, specifically an engine cow flap, washed up on the beach of Flinders Island, which is roughly 350k or 217 miles from King Island. Experts were brought in to examine the debris and and there was a partial serial number on the cow flap that fell within the range that Frederick Cessna would have. So it was this little piece of information that proved that Frederick didn't stage his disappearance, that he didn't fly off course, a fact that his family and friends have been certain of the entire time. But we still don't know what happened that night and it's unlikely that we ever will. To this day, Frederick Valetic is still listed as a missing person and has never been found. So I want to know what you guys think, of course. Do you think this was an alien abduction caught live on a radio recording? Do you think Frederick just saw what he wanted to see, being so into aliens and UFOs? Do you think maybe his obsession drove him out that night, flying around just looking for UFOs with no intention of picking up friends or an order of crayfish? Do you think this was a tragic accident or something more sinister? Let me know what you guys think. I'm seriously intrigued by this case and everyone's different theories. And that, of course, brings us to the end of today's video. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. I really appreciate it. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. And until next time, I will see you later. Bye. Oh, Lily says bye too. Say bye, everyone. <gasps> Say bye. <laughs> oh, you're such a good girl. Oh, you're such a good supervisor. Did I do good? Did I do good? Was it a good video? Yeah. Oh, good. Oh, Lily, too much love. Okay, say bye. I'm going to go before she starts beating up my plants. She does that when she's annoyed. Um, have a good week again. Thank you again for watching the video, and I will see you next time. Bye. I'm sorry. How rude.